Hey, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm your host, Howard Jacobson. Before we get to today's show, a quick reminder that this podcast is free for everyone and supported by those who can afford it. So uh, if you have found this podcast a useful companion during 2020, and you'd like to see it continue through 2021, I would invite you to go to plantyourself.com slash gift. If you are in a position where you have the means to support something that means something to you and hopefully uh, you think is doing good in the world. You can use PayPal or Patreon. You can make a one time contribution or become an ongoing sustaining patron of the show. And if funds are too tight for you to show your appreciation in a monetary sense, you can still leave a review of the Plant Yourself podcast on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. That also helps us a great deal. All right. On to today's episode. This is the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm Howard Jacobson of plantyourself.com, the big change program and well start health. This podcast is part of my mission to to today. I want to talk about my mission. I don't have a guest, but I have a lot of thoughts on my mind and I haven't really done a podcast where I'm doing most of the talking for about three and a half years and I've got a bunch to say and I get comments on the blog and questions and emails from people who say they want to like hear more about me. And I'm always talking with guests and promoting their points of view and drawing them out. And so maybe I thought maybe today would be a good day for me to just riff. And there's a few reasons for choosing today. Um, one is I'm on day three of what I hope will be a seven day water fast. And if you've ever done a water fast, you know that uh, things can get kind of intense on days three and four. And I'm feeling kind of low energy and reflective and kind of both clear and deep at the same time. And I don't know if this is an illusion. I don't know if you're going to listen to this and immediately switch it off because I sound like, you know, I'm on some sort of downer. But at least at least the uh, the hunger is removing any inhibitions that I would have to to share this kind of stuff. Second thing is, um, yesterday was my birthday, my 53rd. And 53 sounds pretty old to me still, you know, somewhere in my head, I'm still like a 17 year old. And I remember um, just getting out of college and getting my first sort of full time job at a school, I was a, an intern teacher and I was assigned to live in a big old house on campus um, that was also populated by five other teachers. And most of us were in our 20s. And one guy was 30. And I remember thinking that 30 was like impossibly old. And so um, reaching 53 um, also makes me think about, you know, the next bunch of decades that I hopefully have and what I want out of them. And it's also yesterday was my dad's 100th birthday or would have been had he not died in 1989 at the age of, of 71 and a bit. And I think a lot about him in general, um, but specifically this this 100th anniversary really brought him up in my mind. And so this has all been swirling. And so I wanted to kind of pull all those pieces together, along with the work that I've been doing uh, with Wellstart, and especially because, see, for the first time with Wellstart, which is a, a startup, it's got some funding, some um, angel investing, venture capital. It's like a real business. And I've always pretty much been involved in, you know, s small stuff in doing my own thing. And I could always allow it to be completely mission driven. But here I've uh, I'm a board member. And so uh, we just had our uh, our quarterly board meeting last week. And I had to look at, you know, financial projections and and P&Ls and cap sheets and all this stuff that's really quite foreign to me. And it's not something that I look at and I go like, oh, this is fun. Look at all these numbers on this spreadsheet. And oh, look at this. And you know, it kind of can feel to me like business, like the purpose is 
to get a return on investment for our stakeholders, especially for our shareholders, the early people who put money into this. And I suspect that it's quite easy for people to lose track of the mission or at least start to give it lip service when the daily mission becomes keeping the doors open, keeping the lights on, paying the mortgage and doing all the business stuff. I'm in the middle of a book that I'm really enjoying. Uh, it's called Measure What Matters, and it's by uh, probably one of the most famous venture capitalists around. His name is John Doerr, D-O-E-R-R, uh, of Kleiner Perkins. He was famously one of the first investors in Google. Um, his investments um, include, you know, lots and lots of really successful companies, including Dropbox and a bunch of others. And one of the things that I was thinking about is like he's talking about the, the startups and OK, and he's talking about a metric or a methodology for management called OKR, which stands for Objectives and Key Results. And it was based on, you know, the work of um, Peter Drucker, this great management guru, but really developed by Andrew, Andy Groves at Intel in the early years, in the, in the uh, late 70s and 80s. And so he's got all these founders telling their stories uh, about how their companies started out, what the mission was, how they grew, and specifically how they grew using this methodology of OKRs. And it's inspiring. It's interesting. But I can't help be a little bit sad because when you see how these companies started out, like Google, like to, to organize all the world's information, and, and how idealistic they were. And then you see kind of what Google has become in terms of bad behavior, in terms of decisions that are made specifically for their own bottom line, the, the lobbying they're doing, the trouble they're getting in, the, their inability to, to question whether the next big thing they're working on is actually going to help the world or just create more of this kind of corporate surveillance state or listening to uh, Sheryl Sandberg talk about the vision of Facebook as a place, something that connects people all over the world. When we see how resistant they are to anything that, that takes away from their bottom line. And I'm worried. I'm worried about myself getting into that mindset of, you know, the mission can be compromised in so many ways because we're starting to see financial success and growth. And we can I can always, um, you know, tell myself that, well, we, of course, we need to grow in order to fulfill the mission that, um, you know, the means here are justified by the ends that we're trying to achieve. And of course, there's truth to that. There's truth to we can't change the world if we can't be financially successful, if we can't pay enough people to do the work, if we can't sustain the work ourselves. But I think there's a line, right? And I don't think that I'm better than anybody else. I don't think that I'm more ethical. I don't think that I have a, a stronger set of values. I don't think my brain is equipped any better than anybody else's to notice my own uh, hypocrisies. So I'm kind of putting this out there as a stake in the ground. And hopefully when people listen to this, if you see me straying from this mission, you'll call me out um, and you'll help me get back on track. All right. So the first part of the mission uh, comes from uh, Well Start Health's, uh, I guess it's our unofficial motto, which is we want to put chronic disease out of business. And this is what really attracted me to the company um, when Olivia and I first started talking. Olivia Kelly is the CEO of Well Start. And I loved that phrase. And, and here's why. Because we know that somewhere between 90 and 99% of chronic disease is preventable. And some number lower than that, but not a huge amount lower than that, is reversible. Which means, if you think about it, that you know millions and millions of people are living with with pain, with disability, with suffering, with financial hardship, 
over medicines, over lost work, over the the dozens of daily uh, accommodations that have to be made that cost money or could require paying other people to take care of you or to take care of kids or other responsibilities you might have. And for me, it's personal because of my dad. Uh, My dad's name was Joel. Uh, He was born on July 30th, 1918, and he was 47 when I was born. So that's why I'm 53 and he's turning 100. So he was an older dad, but he was in great shape. He was never overweight. Uh, He's a small man, about five foot six, five foot seven. He was always around 145 pounds. And from the time I was about three years old, which is to say from the time I remember him, he was an athlete. Um, He loved playing uh, paddle ball and then later racquetball and then later tennis and then squash. And he would always have his gym bag with him. Um, He didn't like, you know, working out in the gym or running or anything like that, but he would work up a sweat playing squash, playing racquetball. Um, He'd go to different health clubs. This was, um, you know, in the late 70s. Well, from the early 70s, there was paddle ball. It's just uh, or even handball. Um, These are all, you know, sort of like Jewish sports that you played in the Northeast, specifically like New, New, New York, New Jersey, Brooklyn, Queens and so anything with, uh, you know, sort of smacking a ball with your hand or with a paddle or a racket, he was into. He got really good at it. And, you know, so he always had his bag with him. Most days he would skip lunch in favor of going to to play. In fact, he, he would hire assistants based on their ability to uh, to give him a good game or beat him at whatever the sport was that he was playing at the time. I'm, I'm sure that breaks a whole bunch of laws, but um you know, he really enjoyed it. And on weekends, every Sunday, we would do a family trip up to the Y or to the racquetball club in the Meadowlands, and we would play for an hour or two. Um, he would go to the sauna or the steam room. Um, and so even though he was old, a lot older than most of my friend's dads, um, you know, I never thought anything of it, even into my late teens And, you know, when I was um, 23, when he turned 70, I just I figured he'd have a long, long life ahead of him. And then he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And, and, you know, here I am, you know, in college, I'm uh, a a student, a researcher. I'd always done well in school. And so I thought, well, let me go see what there is that you can do about prostate cancer. And so while he was talking to doctors and radiologists and all that and getting the mainstream medical opinion, I was sort of looking in libraries and um, alternative bookstores and at the bookshelf um, at the, the Whole Earth Center down in Princeton, looking for alternative things, for other things he could do to, to deal with his prostate cancer. And... One of the things that never came up was diet. It's amazing looking back. But there were, you know, I read books in which it said that the whole problem, the reason we have prostate cancer is because of energetic blockages in the pelvis. And so trying to work to to get him to work with like alternative healers who are going to, um, you know, release the muscles. And I'm sure there's plenty to that. Um, I'm sure... You know I, know, I know it's not sort of evidence based in terms of uh, the Western standard of a randomized control clinical trial. I'm sure, you know, there were people who saw those connections, you know, going back through the history of sort of body work. And I'm sure there's something to that. And I'm sure there's absolutely no harm that can be done by loosening the muscles of the butt and the pelvis and becoming freer. But my dad was a kind of old fashioned man in many respects. And all this talk of sort of, you know, woo woo energy healing, and especially the people who were promoting it in those days were, you know, just shortly out of hippiehood. And they really didn't connect with him. And it really didn't make much sense. You know, he didn't believe in sort of, you know, chi energy or orgone energy or prana, or those things that came, came to us from the East. He was firmly steeped in the Western objectivist 
materialist tradition. And so things that he was going to start doing were certainly had to be materialist and objectivist, which he did. He started doing um, radiation treatments to to shrink the, the cancer and hopefully make it go away or at least not grow back uh, or grow back so slowly that, you know, he died of something else, which is a very common outcome for people with prostate cancer, especially the, the slower growing kinds. And there were lots and lots of books that talked about different herbal remedies or other alternative treatments. And it didn't occur to me that there was ba they were basically following the same model as the pharmaceutical industry, except they were using different substances. You know, wh whether it was um, saw palmetto or ryegrass or, or other formulations, right? like the basic idea was like, do this energy work and take your supplements. And nowhere in there was there a mention of diet. My dad loved his food and he taught me to love food as well. Some of the things we shared together were, uh, you know, number seven plate at Ping Toy Chinese restaurant, which was egg rolls, fried rice and barbecued spare ribs. We loved the hot dogs that you could get at Yankee Stadium and down at um, the Atlantic City Boardwalk. I would always get mine with a grape slushy. Um, we loved all kinds of bread and noodles and blintzes and, uh, and cheeses. He was not much of a cook, except, of course, when it came to the backyard barbecue. And he would cook up the uh, these hamburgers that he would turn so frequently that they would end up, you know, half of them would fall into the grill. And he, he liked them kind of, you know, almost burnt, pretty, pretty well done. Um, he loved egg creams. He loved making chocolate milkshakes. Um, we, we loved getting ice cream. And for dinner, of course, this is, you know, the 70s, the 80s. We would have meatloaf. We would have chicken a lot. We would have, uh, my mother uh, was from uh, Vienna, Austria. So we would have Viennese dishes like goulash, um, either a wurst goulash, which was just... Uh, little hot dogs. And eventually we upgraded from the regular hot dogs to uh, the kosher ones, the Hebrew nationals, which we thought were must be much healthier. And, you know, Hungarian goulash with chunks of meat. And then for holidays, of course, there's all the American holidays, the, the, the turkey on Thanksgiving, but also Jewish holidays uh, with brisket and tongue and, and different kinds of fish and kippers and smelts. In fact, my sister, who was uh, 13 at the time that I was born, loves to remind me that it was the smelts at a Friday night dinner that uh, sent my mother into labor. So that I, I have uh, smelts to thank for my existence. I'm not entirely sure what smelts are. I think they're sort of like cooked sardines, but I could be wrong. I've never I've never actually researched it. Anyway, he would have listened to me if I had come to him with a book with evidence with something that said diet can affect the progression of prostate cancer. But it wasn't out there, or at least I couldn't find it. You know, might it, maybe it was in some weird book somewhere, maybe like in the, you know, the Hygiene Association or some old Herbert Shelton thing, but in nowhere in the, the places that I was looking, and I was looking harder than most people, nowhere was there anything about diet and we just figured his life, his diet and lifestyle were great. He was eating, you know, mostly mostly unprocessed foods, except for uh, he loved malamars and moon pies, as, of course, as, as we all did. Um, but basically eating a pretty healthy diet, you know, vegetables with every meal, piece of meat, a starch, you know, usually rice or potato or noodles. And so we didn't we didn't know. We didn't know how preventable it was. So he went through a year of radiation and its aftermath and gradually got his strength up again. And on Christmas Eve 1989, he suffered a heart attack, which I didn't know about because I had just landed in Israel for a vacation. And this was before cell phones, before the Internet. And so I was just doing my thing and they couldn't reach me. By the time I called home on Christmas Day on the 25th in the afternoon, he had stabilized a little bit. But, um, you know, in talking to my mother on the phone, I could hear how distraught she was 
and how serious it was. So I made plans to return home as soon as possible. So we scuttled our plans, uh, my girlfriend and I, who now my wife, Mia, and we drove straight to Jerusalem. And I worked on um, booking a flight as soon as I could um, back back to New Jersey. And when I called again the next day, December 26th, um, just before um, getting on the flight, my neighbor answered the phone. And I knew then that my dad was dead as soon as I heard her voice. And it was it was heart wrenching. You know, I'd said sort of a quick goodbye to him, joking around as he sent me off to the airport. It wasn't, you know, there was no closure for me. There was no anything. It was just there I was in a foreign country. I was staying in the dorm of a friend of mine whom I knew, but not particularly well. And sort of everyone was kind of trying to accommodate me. I remember I was I had just bought this Casio watch and I wasn't that used to it. And I had it on the wrong setting. It was a little bit too tight. And I was asked as I got off the phone, I'd clenched so hard that I had this incredible pain in my hand and my arm. And I just felt like like that was the thing I was focused on. I remember crying out my hand, my hand. I can't feel my hand and went home. You know, he had died around two thirty in the morning, the day after Christmas the holiday with the, the hospital was short staffed. Um, you know, people were off. It wasn't clear like what had happened, whether people weren't paying attention. But like that obsessed me. Like, what could we have done? What could I have done? What if I had been there? What if there, it hadn't been that day? What if we paid for um, better nursing for someone to be there with him? And the, the, the questions and the self doubts and the blame and the what ifs really haunted me for years. And the one what if that never occurred to me was, what if we knew? What if we knew about Dean Ornish? and about Caldwell Esselstyn, and about T. Colin Campbell, and about Neil Barnard. What if we had that information when he first got sick? Could we have prevented the cancer? Maybe, maybe not. A lot of men get it no matter what. Could we have slowed it down? Almost certainly. Would we have known that prostate cancer is not necessarily something that you need to treat aggressively. And in fact, on the day he died, if you, you can go look this up in the archives in the New York Times science section, Science Tuesday, there was an article saying that one of the things that happens to men who get radiation for prostate cancer is an increased risk of heart attack. Talk about timely and ironic. So shortly after his funeral, I went down, back down to Princeton, where I was living. Um, and I went to a Barnes and Noble bookstore. And for some reason, I picked up and bought the book Diet for a New America by John Robbins. It had come out in 87. I hadn't heard of it. Um, I don't know why I picked it up. I wasn't interested in diet. I was only interested in health to the extent that I was trying to find out what kind of herbs and energetic treatments my father needed. <laughs> but here I was noticing the book from the cover. It wasn't even, you know, the cover wasn't out. I was noticing the uh, the, the side jacket and drawn to the red, white and blue. It had a nice font for the title, I guess. And I picked it up and I started reading it and my entire life changed based on that book. I went vegan instantly. I gave up sugar. Um, I gave up a whole bunch of other stuff. And in 21 days, I lost about 21 pounds uh, without trying, without trying to eat less, without thinking about health, without thinking about weight. Um, I was just so stunned that I hadn't heard any of this before. Friends, that was 19... 90. That was January of 1990. It's now July of 2018, 28 and a half years later, and most people still don't know what I learned that day that I started reading Diet for a New America. 
That was before the China study. That was before prevent and reverse heart disease. And that was before Ornish. I just looked in the index. There's no Ornish in the O's. There are four mentions of Nathan Pritikin. But even then, John Robbins was putting together an argument that I found so compelling that I didn't need to look at anything else. It just made sense to me. And I acted upon it. And I got my act together. And at that point, I felt like I was becoming heart attack proof. I was becoming resistant to the two diseases that together took down my dad, prostate cancer and heart disease. And most people don't know. Most people don't know that chronic disease is preventable and reversible through diet and lifestyle. And so when Olivia said our mission at Wellstart Health is to put chronic disease out of business, I thought about my dad. I thought about the suffering that we all went through losing him at the young age of 71. I want to say a word about him. I know it's not relevant to the medical history, but just what kind of person he was. He was born in 1918. He grew up in the throes of the Depression. And the one thing he wanted to do was help people. And he became a champion for the underdog. He became a labor organizer. He was active in New Jersey politics. Um, and he was famous as one of the men who couldn't be bought. New Jersey politics, there's a lot of corruption that goes back many, many years. He was a straight shooter. He would take on the big guys. In 1974, his friend Brendan Byrne was elected governor, and he was, my dad was appointed to the Public Utilities Commission, which he was very disappointed by at first. He wanted to be the commissioner of labor to help working people in their, in their fight to make a decent wage and have good working conditions in health care. He had been a labor organizer with the United Auto Workers, with the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. He had organized mills up in the Northeast, and he had seen people dying from poor working conditions because the bosses couldn't bear the cost of safety equipment, of slowing down the production line when something looked wrong. And I remember him bringing that attitude to the New Jersey Public Utility Commission, where the first thing he did that I remember he got into the newspaper for was denying New Jersey Bell a rate hike. They had been asking for rate hikes for decades, and it was just a rubber stamp. And not only when my father and the other commissioners looked at their request for a rate hike, not only did they not grant it, but my father convinced one other member to actually roll back their rates. He said, if they're, they're a monopoly... They have no competition, and they were getting fat off of the backs of the poor and the working class. And that's how he was. Um, he later became the commissioner of energy for New Jersey. I believe it was the first uh, com statewide uh, commissioner of energy in the country. Uh, he was involved in early efforts to, to get solar going, to create other renewable sources of energy, to not pollute our planet. Um, he railed against oil companies. In fact, I remember that in maybe in 1980 or 81, the Mobile Oil Corporation took out a quarter page ad in the New York Times blasting him. Um, it was it was titled The Commissioner Bears, Bears His Motives. And it basically accused him of being a socialist because he felt like the oil companies were profiting every time there was an oil crisis, every time there were lines at the pump that they were actually making more money rather than trying to help the, uh, the economy and, and the population that was buying it from them. He was then appointed to the Casino Control Commission, a position he really disliked, but his main effort was to foster the growth, the development of Atlantic City, which had been a war zone. He called it when he became a member of the commission. He saw all these uh, casinos who they were so you know big and lush and lavish and ornate and beautiful. He, he said Atlantic City was a, a war zone with a bunch of Taj Mahals in it. 
And he fought to redistribute some of that wealth to provide employment, to provide education, to provide infrastructure, to provide social support to the inhabitants of Atlantic City and not just let it go to the casino owners, including Donald Trump and Steve Wynn and a bunch of other people who whose only interest was pulling out as much money as they could. After that, he was appointed by a federal judge to clean up one of the most corrupt labor union locals in the country, Local 560 of the Teamsters, located in Union City, New Jersey. And here was a case where he was hated by everyone. <clears throat> the, uh, the Teamster members felt like they had had their democracy taken away because a leader was imposed upon them, even though those leaders weren't union members. They were uh, lining their own pockets. And my father went in and he also had to fight with the companies, the uh, the trucking companies that were hiring the Teamsters, which had had sweetheart deals with the old management, uh, with the old leadership for decades. And gradually, slowly over the course of a year and a half through standing up in full in auditoriums with people cursing him and screaming at him and pounding and not letting him speak, I saw him go to work every single day with the sole objective of restoring trade unionism to that group, of showing them how to be proud of the work they were doing, how to stand up to unjust working conditions. And he was making progress when he was fired for reasons that I'm not going to go into because it's not part of this story. And not too long after that, the health problems began. All this is to say, I really miss the guy. He was a role model that I strive every day to live up to. And sure, there was plenty about him that was not optimal. His temper, his inability to express feelings, his inability to allow anyone else to be sad or angry or depressed or agitated. Growing up in a broken home, he remembers, he told me about hiding under the kitchen sink while his parents fought and not being able to stand any sort of fighting. So, you know, part of my legacy from him is wanting to appease everyone, wanting to avoid conflict at all cost. But still, what I got from him was a sense that to be a man, you had to show courage and you had to stand up for what you believed and you had to stand up for the little guy who couldn't fight for himself, who didn't have a voice. And reading John Robbins' Diet for a New America there, three weeks, two weeks after I had to say goodbye to him and seeing another kind of courage of seeing John Robbins, who, if you don't know, was the heir to the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire and walked away from it. And his argument for veganism was threefold, the same one, the same we have today about health, about the ethics of taking care of animals and not exploiting them and the environmental concerns. Really, nothing has changed since John Robbins wrote that book in terms of the broad outlines of his argument. We filled it in with a lot more data, a lot more details, a lot more nuance. But it was all there in 1987 when he published it and in 1990 when I stumbled across it. And while my father focused his attention and his warrior spirit on helping humans, I saw an opportunity to expand it to helping those with literally no voice with the animals, to the trees that were being cut down to make room for burger farms in the Amazon. And of course, I saw that there was no conflict between caring for people and caring for the environment, that the pollution and the animal agriculture was harming the very people who were depending on it for their livelihoods and who were depending on it for their meals. And as someone steeped in watching my father take on the big guys, take on New Jersey Bell, which eventually became Bell Atlantic, which eventually became Verizon, and seeing him take on the cable companies when he was commissioner of energy, it eventually became Time Warner and Comcast, and seeing him take on Mobile and Exxon and Shell and Chevron, and seeing him take on roomfuls, auditoriumfuls of hostile people 
whom he was still trying to help. I was prepared. I wasn't surprised by the pushback from the dairy industry, from the beef industry, from pork, from chicken, from eggs, from the junk food manufacturers. Eventually, I began to see the link between food and the pharmaceutical industry pushing a profit-driven pharmaceutical model of health and dismissing the idea that lifestyle medicine, that lifestyle could, pay, could play a role. And this all came from my dad. And he checked out at the age of 71. He had just played racquetball. He was in great shape, so we thought. He had recovered, so we thought, from prostate cancer. And I lost him. And I lost years and years of support, of encouragement, of wisdom. People used to say that uh, my dad thought that the sun shone out of my ass, and it really was true. He did not think he was going to have a child. And at the age of 47, he got a surprise. He only married my mother when he was 45 and a half. Everyone who knew him was amazed that he did not stay a bachelor, that someone had reeled him in and turned him into a husband and a father. And no one will ever adore me the way he adored me. And no one will ever stand up for me and support me the way he stood up for me and supported me. And so part of my task as I've grown up is to be that for myself, to be my own supporter, to not have to lean on him because I lost him when I was just 24. And there's so much that I missed out on. So in 1990, you could argue that we didn't know. There was a, there was a little bit out there. There was enough, but it wasn't in the public eye. But now, 2018, after the China study, after Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, after Neil Barnard's work, after Joel Furman's work, after John McDougall's work, after Forks Over Knives, after everything, vegan athletes, we know, we have the data, we have the evidence. Garth Davis put it together beautifully in Proteinaholic, the book that I helped him with. Any doctor who doesn't look at this stuff and see that lifestyle is the first line of defense against disease is not well-trained. Sorry, they're not well-trained. When you look at someone like Sarai Stancic, who's working on a documentary Code Blue and looking at the fact that all these hospitals have McDonald's in them and other fast food places and that medical education doesn't include lifestyle. It just includes the pathologies and how to treat them with procedures, with drugs, with things that make people money. In a, in a world of the Adventist health studies, of the EPIC studies in Europe, the, the largest uh, cohort studies in history, clearly showing the benefits of a plant-based diet, with the Blue Zones work of Dan Butner, showing that the healthiest people in the world eat plant-based. Now I can say there's absolutely no reason for people to be getting sick and dying at the rates they are from completely preventable and largely reversible diseases. And I just multiply my dad and my family by a million just in the U.S. to see the cost I think about the story of my friend Josh Lajani, another co-founder of Wellstart, and his grandparents, his grandpa, whom he adored and worshipped, and his grandmother, who loved him above all else, and how they would, you know, she would feed them, and her her food was love, and how she died shortly after retiring at the age of 67 and hearing about Josh taking care of his grandpa, his Bam Bam, who had been a, a huge, powerful man, but now was laid low by dementia and couldn't take care of himself anymore and couldn't wipe himself and lost all his power, all his dignity 
and lived out his days as, as a shadow of his former self. And I know that these tragedies are occurring daily in households all over the country. What was it? 25% of us have a chronic disease. 25% of us are taking psych meds. We are sick. We are miserable. And you know what? We have to talk about the money, too. All right. I know that I, uh, I separated mission from money a little bit, but I'm kind of in charge of marketing at Wellstart right now. And of course, if we want employers to hire us to make their employees healthier, we've got to talk about bottom line. We've got to talk about dollars and cents. And so I've been looking. I've been studying the effects of the health care crisis on not just individual companies, which is huge, but on the economy as a whole. And basically, it's the rise in health care costs with no attendant improvement in actual outcomes. We're getting it's getting more and more expensive and we're not getting any healthier. That is bankrupting America, that's killed the middle class, that's created this giant chasm between the haves and the have nots. And I'm reminded of my father's work, which was basically economic justice through his work as a union organizer and realizing that the work I'm doing, trying to help people become healthier through their diets and through their lifestyles is also a form of economic justice. And to give you a, a particular sort of right angle example of this, a friend of mine, a uh, supporter of the podcast, is having a hell of a time getting insurance to pay for the things that she needs. And it's her, her problems are not diet induced. They're not lifestyle induced. There's stuff that happens to people. And because we're spending all our money on diabetes care, type 2 diabetes, on cardiac care, on cancer care, on screenings, on dealing with the downstream detritus of a broken healthcare system that can't tell people what to do to fix their problems or to prevent them in the first place. There's no money left for my friend. There's no money left for the orphan drugs, the ones that there's so few people, because there's a genetic condition and so few people suffer from it that the drug company's never going to make back their money on it. That's where our medicine, that's where the Western medicine, medical system should shine, should be heroic, is in helping people with genetic problems, helping people who have been traumatized and and had damage due, done to them by life, by extenuating circumstances where heroic treatment, incredible hours spent in the lab researching could pay off, not in a financial sense, but in terms of helping people, in terms of making the world a better place, in terms of giving those folks a fair shot at a healthy life. But we're spending all our money on completely preventable, completely avoidable conditions that we've known about for at least 28 and a half years. So that's what I'm doing at Wellstart. We've developed a platform and a protocol that teaches people, that shows them the clear evidence and gives them the skills, both the cooking skills and the walking and jogging skills, uh, and the meditation skills, the sleep hygiene skills, but also the mental, the mindset skills, the thought patterns, the emotional strength to start to make these changes in a world that still poo-poos them, that still tells you you're crazy if you're eating a healthy diet. It doesn't say a word if you're eating all your meals from McDonald's, but the minute you go plant-based, everybody's worried about your nutrition. In a world in which mm, bacon is a reason to take in a type 1 carcinogen, a world in which most smart, health-concerned people are getting completely the wrong message about what to put in their mouths. And the astounding popularity of ketogenic diets, of paleo, of low carb, because people are getting short term weight loss results and because if they have sensitivity to grains, they're feeling better in the moment, we are teeing ourselves up 
for additional unnecessary tragedies as people my age go on the statins, go on the antihypertensives, go on the beta blockers, go on the proton pump inhibitors, and then take all of the additional meds required to deal with the side effects of those meds. Meanwhile, their underlying disease conditions are galloping forward. They're not being treated. The symptoms are being treated. So our mission at Wellstart, my mission, is to come up with the very, very best protocol, the best pedagogy, the best coaching, the best support we can come up with to make this information, this life-saving information, available, accessible, palatable, actionable, sustainable. We're doing this with companies, and we're also doing it for individuals. So you may remember the big change program that Josh Lajani and I founded, and we've run for a couple of years. That's been rolled into Wellstart Health. And the DNA of that program, big change, still informs what we're after. We're not looking for teeny little changes like most wellness programs. You know, park farther away from the entrance, take the elevator, not the stairs, um, drink more water during the day. Now, all of that is great advice. But if that's the extent of it, or if that's what we really believe, the, 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 that's all people are going to do. And so we don't want to tell them to do something that they're not going to do. And so we're going to pitch the bar so low, then we're not going to accomplish anything. People aren't going to see improvement. And so then why would they continue doing this inconvenient thing? We're looking for big change, for big changes in diet, for big changes in lifestyle, for people to become, again, the bipedal animals that we are, for big changes in mindset. And the biggest change of all is that we have agency, that we have some control. We have a lot of control. We have way more control than we were taught about our own health destiny. And once people start understanding that, once people see behind the curtain and they see that we have been lied to by omission and by commission, by the media, by the government, by corporate America, by our teachers, Maybe they didn't know any better. Maybe they believed that we wouldn't listen. Maybe they believed that we couldn't do it. Once you try that for yourself, you try the plant-based diet for yourself for 10 days, for 7 days, for 14 days, for 3 days, for crying out loud, you will realize that you've been lied to and the scales will fall away from your eyes, not just about food, but about so many things that we are taught, that we just have to put up with, we just have to accept in this world. I haven't even gotten into the part of the mission related to our climate, to our environment, to this beautiful planet, this incredible orb that has everything we could ever need. Man, if you think about the beauty, and as far as we know, the only one, the only one that we've ever found that can sustain our life, a few months ago, I put Josh Lajani in touch with Nelson Campbell, who is the director of the, the documentary Plant Pure Nation and the creator of Plant Pure Foods, these wonderful frozen meals that you people can buy very inexpensively and, and make the transition without having to learn how to cook. Um, and they were together in Louisiana. And Josh took Nelson and a few other folks out on a boat to show them where the land used to be, where New Orleans is going missing, where the bayou is disappearing because the waters are rising, where people's lifestyles are being overturned. And I'm not even going to talk about all the, the wildfires and the, the, the bigger storms and the, and the heat waves that are, that are happening because of our dependence on animal agriculture above any other single factor. That once you try the food and you see that you get better, you develop a mindset of agency and you develop a mindset of growth that you can make a difference 
and that you can make yourself into a person who makes even more of a difference. That's really the big change we're looking for. Yes, we want people to lose weight and get healthy. We want people to reverse their diseases. We want people to have beautiful biometrics, low cholesterol, low blood pressure, normal blood sugar. But we really want people to wake up to accept the mantle that all of us need to accept now if we want to save ourselves on this planet. Keep thinking about uh, the Dr. Seuss book, Horton Hears a Who, where only when the last little who shouts out does their little world get saved. And I think we're the same. We need all hands on deck. This is not a time for most of us to be relaxing in the cabins below, watching TV or napping. We are in a maelstrom. We are in the perfect storm. And we need all of us. And we need all of us invigorated and healthy and clear-eyed. And that's really the mission of Wellstart Health that I embrace. And of course, we can't do it without running a successful business and making money. We have to promote, we have to market, we have to sell, we have to charge money for this stuff that I would dearly love to give away, which I have been giving away through this podcast and through other things which Josh Lajani has been giving away through personal texting and Instagram direct messaging and Facebook messaging and phone calls with hundreds of people over the last several years. And we've got to now, you know, look at hard dollars and cents and figure out how am I spending my time? How are we spending our money? Are we getting a return? Can we grow this thing to the place where it's big enough to fulfill our mission? Can we make enough of a return for the brave people who have invested in us, who have given us their trust so that others in the future will also invest in businesses like ours so that we can continue growing a socially responsible business with the mission of moving the world in the right direction? Are we making enough money to pay our coaches, to pay our chief technology officer, to pay ourselves so that other people look and say, okay, I can make a living doing this too, right? People become doctors because they want to help, they want to heal, but they also become doctors because doctors make a good living. I don't want to live in a world where people have to choose between doing what they love doing the work that ignites their soul and making a good living. So that's what I'm up to. Uh, this is probably a good time to mention that we have another public cohort beginning on August 13th, another public cohort run by Wellstart Health. It's a 12 week intensive. It involves me and Josh and others coaching you. It involves daily check-ins with uh, your coaches via text, private coaching, private texting messages. It involves uh, weekly group Zoom calls. Those are, those are you know, live video calls with recorded audio available if you can't make them. It includes a community in which we, we get together. We have group discussions and a forum for people supporting each other, offering each other advice and help and camaraderie and daily short videos that both teach and inspire, that empower action. And the truth is, every cohort is different from the one before it. Every cohort, we're doing a little bit better. We're a little bit smarter. We're learning what works and doesn't work. And we've got about six cohorts under our belt now. And I can say with complete confidence that the one that begins on August 13th will be the best one we've ever done. The overt goals are to help you get to your ideal weight, get fit, and reverse any markers of chronic disease or actual clinical symptoms of chronic disease, to get you well, to get you healthy, to get you lean, to get you fit, to get you energized so that you too can throw your weight into the fight, into the fight for our planet, into the fight for our people, into the fight for a world that we want to live in. So if you're interested or if you know anyone who could benefit, please send them to wellstarthealth.com. They can read all about it. 
And if they have questions, they can reach out to me directly, Howard at WellStartHealth.com. And if they're ready, you, you or they can go to WellStartHealth.com slash apply. And I will put all that in the show notes and you can check it out. One more timely thing tonight. That's July 31st, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Josh and I are holding a webinar called The Three High Hurdles to Weight Loss and Health. And we're going to be sharing what we've discovered through coaching hundreds of people, the three biggest mindset mistakes people make. And we're not talking about, you know, uh, making mistakes with like cooking breakfast or too much oil or stuff like that. That's, that's easy to correct. The mindset shifts that are needed to sustain success are the hard part. And it's where I think we are distinguishing ourselves in the marketplace through our understanding of behavioral science and through our coaching protocols and through the way that we're um, using technology to reach people in a very high touch way. Um, if you're interested in signing up for that webinar, you can do so at plantyourself.com slash now slash N-O-W, all lowercase, which will take you to the right page on the WellStart platform, which actually is wellstarthealth.com slash three dash hurdles. But it's probably easier to remember plantyourself.com slash now, N-O-W, as in why wait? All right, so this has been an unusual episode of the Plant Yourself podcast. I'll just say a few closing words. It's weird to not... Uh, go back to an interview that I would pre-recorded, but uh, let's just keep it going. So um, as I mentioned, I'm on day three of what hopefully will be a seven day fast. I'm still nursing a bum ankle. So there ain't much running this week, just walking and uh, helping my daughter move back into the house, hopefully for a little while as she finds her feet and goes off on her next big adventure. Um, in garden news, the Austrian cow peas are coming in. These are wonderful peas. They're really long sort of beans um, with maybe you know, 10 or 12 or 15 sometimes individual peas inside them. So um, they, they produce quite a lot. And I'm looking forward to several uh, pea stews over the, the course of the winter. Um, and what else is happening in the garden? The kale is, is just about done where I have to go back, sadly, to a store-bought kale. Um, until it uh, becomes cooler in uh, late summer, early fall, we can plant some more. And the blueberries are mostly done as well. The grapes are plumping up, and I imagine within uh, three to four weeks, we'll start to be able to eat our delicious scuppernung muscadines with the thick skins, the extremely sweet flesh, and the giant pits. All, all good stuff. If you'd like to support the mission of this podcast, you can do so at plantyourself.com. Just scroll down the right sidebar and you can see the Patreon link where you can become an ongoing contributor. You can contribute as little as a dollar a month or as much as you'd like. I have not put an upper limit on uh, what you're able to contribute. Every little bit helps keeping the hosting paid for, helping to defray some of the costs of my time, helping me get better equipment as I go traveling and um, helping me promote the podcast with better tools so that I can reach more people and attract uh, other guests as well who, who might need a bigger audience in order to be interested in coming on the show. You can also do the single easiest thing, which is to leave a review and a star rating on iTunes. That really helps us reach more people. And of course, you can share this and other episodes with your friends. This was episode 281. And if you want to check out the show notes, I don't think there'll be very many. I have to write them now. Um, but you can read you can read them at uh, plantyourself.com slash 281. And if you're new to the show, uh, you can catch up on 280 very different episodes at plantyourself.com. All right. Well, it's time for thanks. Thanks to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace, as the theme music for this podcast. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Today, I want to say your names so that they, everyone can hear them. This is going to take a while, so I understand if you, dear listener, want to go listen to something else. But I really want to acknowledge uh, in a meaningful way uh, the people who are, all of you who are helping me and who have helped me define my mission 
and and begin to to realize it in my life. The uh, it's not lost on me how lucky I am, how fortunate to have found something that lights me up so much, and to have found a community that supports it. I promise you, if I didn't have so many listeners, fans, contributors, partners, I would not still be doing this. This is not sustainable without a community. And so you are a big part of my community, and I'm going to say your names right now. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Morrow, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherly, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Behrens, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jen Vilkanovsky, David Bizek, the mysterious Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Victoria Dolomanova, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Landry, Josina, Julianne Rowland, Stu Dolnick, Sarah Durkis, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Leanne Peterson, Janet Selby, Claire Adams, Tom Franzak, Jeanette Benham, Gila Lacert, David Donahue, Blair Seibert, Doron Avizov, Gio and Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesner, Ruth Ann Funderburk, Misha Rosen, Michael Warabek, the equally mysterious Tracy Z, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lineman, Nick Harper, Stephanie Holness, Martha Bergner, Nicole Ramsey, Susan Ahmad, Molly Levine, the inscrutable Harry R, Susan Laverty, the Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Ashley Corcoran, Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch of Plant Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Kopel, Shell Rutledge, Julian Watkins, Reed O'Connell, Brian Sheridan, Shannon Hirschman, Kate Rolls, Linda Ayat, Julie Lang, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinwa, Connie Hainline, Erin Greer, Alicia Davis, Aviva Lael, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Orlikowski of Plant Powered for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Mirani, Karen and Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Kelly Baker Miracle, Ann Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justine Divot, Joshua Summermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, and Lori Fanny for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for this week. See you next week, back with our usual interview for your format. And as always, be well, my friends. All right, time for thanks. Thanks to Will Reidenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace. You can find more of Will's music at his website, willreidenauer.com. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Maurer, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherly, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Mr. Cobb, Rachel Behrens, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jennifer Polkinowski, David Bizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Leia Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Landry, Josina, Sarah Durkis, Rhymes of Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Janet Selby, Janet Selby, Janet Selby, hi Janet, Claire Adams, Tom Franzak, Jeanette Benham, Gil Lasser, David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Jerome Avizo, Gio and Carl- Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesen, Ruth Ann Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, the equally mysterious Tracy Z, Aviva L, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lineman, Rhymes with Cinnamon, Nick Harper, Martha Bergner, Susan Ahmad, Zanali Levine, the inscrutable Harry R, Susan Laverty, the Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch at Plant Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Kubel, Julian Rodkins, Breed O'Connell. Shannon Hirschman, Linda Ayat, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinwa, Connie Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Olakoski of Plant Powered for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Karen Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Dan Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justin Divot, Joshua Summermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Lenny Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan Bacorny, Stephen Leenan, Patty DiMartino, Mike and Donna Cartes, Dean Bishop, Bill Briel, Gunter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Kelly Molden, Trisha Adams, 
Megan Kramer, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bashor, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gullich, Laura Heaton, Meg from Mama Says, Rochelle Kennedy, Diana Goldman, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, Holly Butler, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parang Ganshi, Amy Daly, Brian Tourbell, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, Josie Dempsey, Karen Schmidt, Pamela Hayden, Emily Perryman, Olga Sidorowska, Allison Corbett, Richard Stone, Lauren Vaught of Edible Musings, Aaron Hasty, Sean Owen, Sawyer Nayak, Erica Piedra, Danielle Roberts, Michael Lushton, and Sarah Johnson for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for now. As always, be well, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>